Hey everyone, my name is Noble and I'm the Connections Pastor here at the River Church. Thanks for checking out one of our messages today. We would love to connect with you and your family. An easy way to do that is you can text River Connect to 97000 or you can go online to our website, theriverchurch.cc, to learn more about us and our upcoming events. If you'd like to give to the River Church, you can text an amount to 84321 or you can go online to our website and click the giving tab. Thanks again for joining us today, and I hope you're blessed by the message. Good morning, everyone. So I preached on adultery, lust, and divorce the last two weeks, and you came back. Wow, I mean, you're committed. This is amazing. Uh, it's just knowing God's truth is, is so real and so loving, and uh, so just so thankful that you're here. And if you have a Bible, we, we'll be in Matthew chapter number 5. It's funny, multiple times this morning I've had people come up to me and go, okay, what are you doing this week? I mean, people want warnings now. And they're like, what is it? I said, I'm preaching on swearing. It's e- I mean, this is just, uh, some, I heard that my husband needs this. That's what I heard from somebody. I don't know. Uh, no, but um, just uh, excited. Uh, we have two more weeks left in this uh, as we're studying the rest of uh, Matthew chapter 5. And I'm um, so just excited for that. Uh, I do want you to know that there's so many ministries that go on at the church. Uh, we, I could sit up here all morning and talk about all of those, but it was great. Yesterday, uh, we got to feed about 50 families for Thanksgiving. We gave a turkey and a meal. And so just really awesome. We have people serving here. And, and just thank you for your giving. That gives us ability to do those things. But just thank you for that. So Matthew chapter number five, we're going to dive right in. Verse 33 says, again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath on your head. For you cannot make one hair white or black. So understanding the scripture, it's saying you're not allowed to dye your hair. That's the interpretation (laughs) of this path. It's not. I'm just kidding, okay? It's bad, bad hair. It says, do not take an oath for your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. And let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. So studying the Sermon on the Mount, we see again, coming back to Jesus is telling his listeners, the Pharisees and their relationship with the Lord is a scam. It is phony. It is fake. It is not real. They go through rituals and they go through the motions, yet Jesus is saying they do not have a relationship with God. They don't know me. They don't follow the Lord. And in this, Jesus is telling and pointing to the listeners. He's showing their their phoniness. And in this chapter, over and over again, Jesus says, you've heard it was said. He's saying, "You've, you've been taught these things, but I tell you that you truly don't understand what the Lord is saying. I have come to reveal the truth. I haven't come to destroy what what the Old Testament says. I've come to fulfill it and so that you understand it clearly. And so here Jesus, again, speaks on another, um, I think some would say, well, this sure isn't as heavy of a topic. He spoke of murder and anger. He spoke of adultery and lust. And then he spoke on divorce and and telling how important marriage is, that, that marriage is from the Lord and And now he speaks of a promise. We had lunch this week with the staff. Uh, One of the days this week we went out to lunch and one of the staff said, it just seems a little lighter, almost like it doesn't fit. But when I've studied this, you find it's pretty heavy. God talks about words are really important. Jesus here, he, he, he points this out and here he talks about promises. See, in Matthew 12, 34, the Bible says this. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Here the Lord says our words show who we are. 
So much so that a couple of verses down in Matthew 12, 36 says, I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. So what he is saying is, words are a reliable indicator, one guy said, of what's going on in here. Our words, they, they show who we are. What, what our mouth says reveals our heart. And too many times we in the church, we think my heart's good, I just got to fix my mouth. But the truth is, our mouth is wrong because of our heart. And over and over again, we see in what Jesus is preaching, he brings us back to the heart of the issue, the relationship with him, coming back to needing a savior. So this issue of truth is so important. One, it's so important because we see Jesus, right? Jesus came in grace and in truth. Jesus comes, it says in John chapter 1, full of grace and truth. When the Bible speaks of the Holy Spirit that will come, the helper, the helper is described as the spirit of truth. In 1 John, we read more about that truth, but you'll find 1 John 4, 6 speaks of there are those who will listen to God's word and they will follow the spirit of truth and then there are those who will reject it and they, are, they will live in the spirit of error, is what the Bible says. See, in direct opposition to the truth is a lie. That's why the Bible says Satan, the prince of this world, is a liar. John 8, 44. The system, right, that he heads up is characterized by lying. And we see it today. The fight for truth. Go on social media and try to say something true. For some reason, I think you'll get a little pushback, no matter what it is, right? The sky is blue. We're going to fight this. We're going to fight. So there's this constant battle of truth. But here's the deal here. Jesus says, if we are true followers of him, Christians must speak truth. And there is a shortage of truth. We, we, we must speak truth, the shortage of truth. When I heard shortage of truth, I, it just took me back to like when, when COVID came and everybody's like, the whole world is going to run out of toilet paper. Let's go get toilet paper. And all of you stocked up your house with toilet paper. Some of you haven't bought toilet paper in three years because you're still running on what you bought three years ago. Other of you didn't listen, and you were using other paper. We won't go to never mind, all right? But there was that shortage. You're like, okay, I got I to gotta stock up. There is a shortage of truth. We as the church, we must desire to know God's tr- truth, to live out his truth, and to speak words of truth. It is so important. And that is what Jesus is saying here. So I'd like to explain through the verses what Jesus is saying, what he's saying about the Old Testament, what he's saying about the Pharisees, and what he is giving to us on how to live. So going back to that first verse, verse 33, he says, Again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. What is this? This is an oath. Jesus is saying, You've heard. You've heard it taught that when you make an I promise, when, when you say I, I promise and you can attach whatever you want to that it promises, you need to follow through. The Old Testament, now here, right, this is, this is the fourth kind of you have heard it said, but I say to you. The other ones were really attached to a, a commandment. This one's I mean, we have the commandment of you you shall not take the Lord's name in vain and you shall not be a false witness pointing about lying. But here it's taking some other verses talking about making an oath, swearing by the name of the Lord, right? It it reminds me, it goes to this, like when we say, "I, I promise, I cross my heart and I hope to, I stick a needle in my, you know, like, like this is. We, we add to our promise. I had a, when I was growing up, the neighbor kid, he would always add, whenever he wanted to like 
emphasize that he wasn't lying, he would always say, I swear in my mother's grave. And that can take you to some that trying to make what they say to like prove it, they say what? I, I, I swear to God. So here Jesus says, you, you, you've heard it said that those who take an oath, they have to follow through with what they say. And this thing of an oath, right? It, it's, it's naming something or someone greater than that person to invoke that, to, to give like greater credibility, right? You can hold it, you can hang it on this. That, that's an oath. Hebrews 6.16 6, explains it like this. For people swear by something greater than themselves, and in all their disputes, an oath is final for confirmation, right? They swear by other things. This is what was happening in Jesus' day. This is still what happens today. We promise. So Jesus is pointing out what the Old Testament says. Leviticus 19.12. You shall not swear by my name falsely. And so profane the name of your God. Numbers 32, if a man vows a vow to the Lord or swears an oath to bind himself by a pledge, he shall not break his word. And then Deuteronomy 23, 21, if you make a vow to the Lord your God, you shall not delay fulfilling it. It's talking about making this this oath, this promise. And so we see in the Old Testament oaths these promises that have this divine attachment to it, this this umph to it, this extra weight. Many times one said the oath is calling on God. It invites God to witness the truthfulness of what is said or to avenge it if it becomes a lie. We see these oaths, and, and I would say all the time, but it's not all the time. There are Heavy circumstances, specific circumstances that this happens. Like in Genesis 24, Abraham makes an oath with the servant, says, you will for sure not do this. Promise me. Promise on the Lord that you will not do this. You can go to Isaac. You can go to David and Jonathan. They make oaths. And there is this heaviness To misuse God's name is a big deal. Like this goes back to not take the Lord's name in vain. Taking the Lord's name is vain. When you invoke his name, you say, no, I I promise to God. And then you don't follow through. You use the Lord's name in vain. We even see that God makes an oath. Genesis 22. Genesis 22, 16 and 17. Right? The Lord says, by myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and not withheld your son, your only son. So the Lord here makes an oath. So I want to read this little paragraph because it helped me understand it. Since God could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself. Obviously, the Lord's promises made with an oath were no more truthful or binding than anything else he promised. Do you hear that? It it didn't make these things more truthful. It is not that God makes an oath because his word would otherwise be questionable or unreliable, but because he wished to impress upon men a special importance or urgency related to the promise. You see, Jesus, he he says, truly, truly, or verily, verily, pointing the the emphasis here. It does not mean that scripture, right, is more truthful than other passages of what what the Lord says is true. But here, what we see is that these oaths were important. They were made during special times. They were not thrown around lightly. And there was this weight put on it. Well, why? Because we're liars. We we like to lie. We like to just fib a little. Does that make you feel better? We we like to just exaggerate. I mean, manipulate a little bit. If you're new with us, sometimes I speak sarcastically. I'm sorry. This is our flesh, right? We... Unless things, 
unless the truth gives advantage to us, we like to find a way to get around it. If the truth doesn't help us, how many times have I then tried to skirt around the truth? So here we see the, the heaviness of an oath. So as I was reading this, I, I came across in, in Matthew 26. So you have Bible, turn over there real quick. We'll come back to chapter 5. But Matthew 26, if, if you've been in the church a while, or if you haven't been in the church, right before Jesus went to the cross, Peter, his loudmouth disciple, told Jesus that he was in it to win it. Like he was not, not going to bail on Jesus. And Jesus says, Peter, I'm not done with you. But tonight you're going to bail on me. And in Matthew 26, I just want, to see, want you to see the heaviness of an oath. Uh, verse 69. The Bible says, Now Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard as a servant curl came up to him and said, You were with Jesus. But he denied it before them all, saying, I do not, do not know what you mean. So he lies. And when he went out to the entrance, another girl saw him. And she said to the bystanders, this man was with Jesus. And again, he denied it with an oath. He didn't just deny it. Now he's bringing along credibility. I do not know the man. After a little while, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, certainly you two are one of them. Then he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear and maybe you've read that before, like, Peter had a potty mouth? Is that what? No, no, no. When he is swearing, right, he is making every promise he can, bringing whatever weight to say, I do not know the man. And immediately the rooster crowed. So I was studying oaths, man, it made it so much heavier to me. What's amazing, we look at the grace of God right up upon Peter. He was not done with Peter, even though that heavy rejection, right? We see he wasn't done, the beautiful grace and love of God. But here Jesus says, this is what you believe. This is, I want you to understand what an oath is. And then he goes on to say, verse 34. He says, but I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, and then he goes on to list, by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or, or by earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, or, or by your head. Don't take an oath by these things. Well, what is he doing? He's pointing out the nonsense of the Pharisees. See, what has happened with the Pharisees that they had become a group that said, well, we know that we cannot swear upon God or his name. But other things, as long as we do this, we're good. Right? You can say whatever. Nope, I had my fingers crossed, I'm sorry. And, and like, funny game when we were in elementary school, but this is what the Pharisees and many times the church can do where we play the game. Well, I, I didn't really make the promise. It wasn't really. I, I, it, it. And this is what they were doing. So instead of an oath being a mark of like integrity or weight, they were abusing it, trying to invoke confidence in things that they were going to lie about. And this is why he's saying, if, if you have the righteousness of a Pharisee, if you're just playing the game of church and you're just walking through the motions and not seeing, to, not seeing that you're running away from the truth and not running to it. This is what Jesus is pointing out. And we live in this kind of thing. We live in the thing that, where we, just our culture, there's the practice of trying to convince people that we're telling the truth. And we do that by invoking somebody to stand up for it. Watch almost any commercial out there, right? 
Here is beer. If you drink more beer, this is the lady you will have. Here's the six-pack, even though I don't know how drinking all that. Through. But anyways, you'll get this. You'll have this teeth. And to prove it all, here's Tom Brady to say it really is going to happen. Right? Every Now, this isn't bashing Tom Brady. This is a star I thought of, right? But that's what happens. We, we, we show things trying to convince you. Every, but, and, and, and if we can bring somebody along to invoke that, but what is happening is everything becomes a scam and a lie, and you're going, okay, is that a scam or a lie? Is that a scam or a lie? You guys don't believe every commercial you watch? No, what? Because I don't know if, is that a scam or a lie? Is that a scam or a lie? And now it's moved into the church. Is that pastor a scam or a lie? Is that a scam or a lie? And Jesus says, that can't be who we are. That can't be. Here's what it looks like to be a follower. This is what the kingdom of heaven looks like. You know what it looks like? Truth. People say what they mean. People in the church who follow the Lord, they're not liars. They stop promising. They just start saying yes and no. And so here Jesus is saying, listen, you, you say if you promise by this, you, you don't have to follow through. I'll, I'll give you a verse, uh, Matthew 23, 16. You got that one? Matthew 23, 16. The lady who's doing the verses today said, are you going to go in order? Because if you don't go in order, then I have to flip like three screens back to get to the verse you're at. So, Sorry. Jesus speaking to the Pharisees, Woe to you blind guides who say, If anyone swears by the temple, it's nothing. But if anyone swears by the gold of the temple, he is bound by an oath. What is he saying? So, so if you got your fingers crossed, it's okay. If, you know, if it's just a little white lie, it's okay. If it's not going to bring an advantage to you or bring a blessing to you, it's okay. And Jesus says, it's not okay. Stop making oaths. Stop it. Stop making everyday oaths where you go, I got to promise or I, gotta, or I have to invoke somebody else. And he says this, let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. Jesus calls followers of him to be habitual truthers. See, when I think of the word habitual, I only think of habitual liar. That's where I go. But to habitually, consistently, as a habit, it's regular, habitual truthers. Pathological truthers. That means we get to a place because we're feeding ourselves with God's truth and we trust his truth. That we become compulsive and obsessive. We got to get to the truth. And when we veer off because we veer off and we become selfish and the flesh rises up, it immediately brings us to conviction and we repent we as Christians, right, we should be the most repentant people there are. Because knowing his truth and knowing his goodness, when we veer off of that, that light shines down and we go, Lord, I'm sorry. Veer me back to your path. Veer me back to your truth. May we be habitual truthers. What had happened is the Pharisees, and we do it so well, they thought there are the things that are above the table that we have to speak truth about. But then there's the under the table. You know, under the table where you're like, well, I know I get taxed for this stuff, but if I get paid under the table, I get away with it. I tried to find the origin of under the table. Went back to like cards and stuff. You just said, okay, here you go. I'll give you an ace. You know, like under the table. Nobody sees it. You get away with it. 
So what have we done? We've said, there are, the Pharisee says, there are the things that God says are important. So those things, those heavy things, we have to be truthful about. But then there's those things that God doesn't really care about. He doesn't know. He doesn't see. The thing at work that I could get away, he doesn't, it's okay. And we think that these are the things that are under the table that we get away with. To read one, we, the, the shading of the truth, the cheating, the exaggerating, the making a promise with having no intention of keeping it. Like, I'll pray for you. Well, we all got convicted there, didn't we? All right, every one of us went. <laughs> That's why you pray right away. When you say, I'm going to pray for you, get praying. That's what you have to do. That's what I do. So when I text you and say, I'm praying for you, it's because right then I'm praying for you. To exaggerate, to betray. I think about that hymn, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to lie, prone to exaggerate, prone to manipulate, prone to, to be a people pleaser, prone to... Sorry, I'm just going on my... And needing to run back to the Lord. Needing to run back to his truth. Listen, if you're in here and you know the Lord, we, we need to have credibility. You need to have credibility at your work, with your kids, to your wife. I'm thankful. My wife and I, I've never one time in our marriage have I ever had to look at my wife and go, okay, do you promise those words aren't used. She doesn't have to say, I promise. I don't have to say, I promise. Because she, her words are truth. We don't have to use those kind of oaths. That's what Jesus is pointing out here. To have that credibility. It just makes me think of, funny, in my life, uh, when I was 14, see, I grew up in Waterford. I went to Cooley. I went to Pierce. My dad worked at uh, Pontiac Motors. He retired. He took a little church up in the thumb of Michigan on the corner of a cornfield. So when I was 14 years old, really happy about this decision in life, moved away from all my friends up to farmland, so happy. And my dad took this little church and went to the school called Elkton Pigeon Bayport high school. We'll shorten that to EPBP or Laker High School. Right? Why? Because every single town within like 20 miles went to that school. So it was about 450 kids. And going there, I mean, they called me the city. And all of us go, you're from Waterford? No, it's the city. Like, right? We all know that. I was just the kid from South. I had no farm cred. That was the problem. Like, this guy, no farm cred with this guy. Didn't know what a combine was. They would quiz me. I'm like, is that a tractor? <laughs> Not a tractor. I don't even know the differences still. But, you know, like, I worked on the farm one time in all those years up there. That was it. Never went back. And I'm like, I ain't doing this again. But to have farm credibility, it didn't have it. makes me think of, like, street cred, right? Like, to have street cred, like, okay, okay, he took the punch. He's got street cred. That credibility. Here, the church must have truth cred. It's what we have to carry around. That they look at Christians and go, no, they're, they're, they're honest. They're truthful. Why? Because we trust the truth. We trust the Lord. And that's what this sermon, right? It brings us back to trusting the Lord. Do we in our life trust that Jesus and who he is and what he says is true. Do we know or do you believe that when Jesus died on the cross and rose again, that because of his perfection, your sins may be forgiven? Do you believe it? Do you trust that what he's saying is true? And if you do trust that it's true and that life in him and the truth in him is the best, 
then let's live it out together. That because of his salvation, changes how we speak. Because we trust him who is true. Ephesians 4.25, therefore having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor. For we are members one of another. So that just leads me to a few questions, and I'll be done. Let me answer one. So as you're reading this, you may ask, so are all oaths banned? Are we never allowed to take, as we read this, he says, don't, no oath, are oaths banned? And you may go, what about the vow I took in marriage? I got to go to the courthouse next week. Do I say, I'm not putting my hand on the Bible? And there were those, like the Quakers thought this is what it was saying, that oaths are done, you can no longer take an oath, so don't put your hand on the Bible, don't make a vow at your wedding, don't, don't make those promises. And I, honestly, I don't believe that's what it's saying here. The reason for that is you see God takes an oath, you see at the Old Testament, what, what it does is it is not flippantly making promises. We are to do away with that. Is what this is saying. Don't make promises and oaths every stop doing that. There were special times in the Old Testament, and then we even see that carry into the New Testament. We see Paul, right? He says, I tell you this on the weight of Christ. So we see those things. So I don't think it's pointing to never doing those things. But what he's saying is it, it doesn't change anything. Whether you say I promise or you don't. It's yes or it's no. You don't have to carry the weight of a promise, of a signature. What you say is true. And here he's sowing, that's what kingdom-minded life looks like. It calls us to radically live truthfully. So a couple personal questions. Have you created a culture where you need to add weight to your words? Have you lived a life where you feel like you have to say I promise or I swear? Can I tell you as a Christian, work to change that. I know that doesn't change overnight. But your testimony can change. Your words can change. Your truthfulness, how you live, right? I know you may say, but I made that mistake. Yep. And the Lord who is gracious and good, like, forgives us. And let's work to be truthful now. And that may take a while. But I believe with God's strength, you can change that path. You can live out that truth. Fight against those little white lies. Fight against, hey, I'll be there and not showing up. Fight against saying things and not following through. Fight through using words to manipulate the conversation, even though you're just twisting, the, the, twisting it a little bit. Ask the Lord for conviction. And that leads to my next question. Do you notice that you've stopped noticing your lies? Do you notice that that exaggeration it's just kind of normal now. That, that, that just that little, that it has become a style in your relationship where those things are just kind of no big deal. I have to fight against it. Well, how do I, how do I know? Pastor, you said, I, I, I don't notice, so how can I notice? Ask your boy. Ask him, son, do, do I tell the truth? Not, not there, okay. Ask your spouse. Do you feel like I'm honest? Not in that area, huh? Okay. Ask a coworker. 
all right, pastor, like this is just, I, I don't want to have these conversations. Here's what Jesus is doing. He's saying, if you know me and you trust me, get ready for a radical life that is different than what the world lives. It is different. It's a different path. It's a different life. It's a different speech. It's a different talk. It's a different kind of being a dad. It's a different kind of being a mom. It's where you sit in the truth and you fight for the truth. And when you do sin and you do lie, you go and you repent because you run back to him. And the final question is, do you then trust God's truth? Matthew 12, 34, again, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Hopefully this morning brings the heart issue in. Points to the heart. And so that you look at your words and go, man, it's not my mouth that is a problem. It's my heart. What is so amazing here as you read what Jesus says, he, he calls us to come to him. After the eight o'clock gathering, I had a lady walk up to me and just in tears, she said, Pastor, how? I look back and see all the times I've been so mean to my husband, just so swinging a sword, just so how, how will I stand before the Lord? And I looked at her and said, you'll stand before the Lord because of Jesus, right? In, in, in our brokenness and in our sin, this is where we turn to Christ. The Sermon on the Mount points to, hey, if any of you are trying to get to heaven on merit, well, when you read this, you go, man, I am going to fall so short you read this and I look at it and go, man, I love to lie. I lo when it is for my advantage, I'll tell the truth. But when it's not, I sure don't want to. But knowing the truth of the Lord and running to him and trusting in him. And that he is faithful to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Is the wonderful grace and mercy and truth of the Lord. And church, if we know Christ, let's fight to be truthers, huh? Let's have that testimony to the world. They go, man, they got truth cred. I, I don't have to make double down or make sure they, they got truth cred. Let that be our testimony. As we follow Jesus, who came full of grace and truth. Will you stand, please? Let me pray for you. Sing a song of worship and then have a baptism. Lord Jesus, thank you. I just praise you, God. Thank you for opening my eyes to your truth. I pray for those in here who don't know you. Lord, may this morning their eyes be open to your wonderful grace and mercy and the salvation that you offer. And this morning, Lord, they will repent of their sins and accept you, God. We praise you in Jesus' name.